Good afternoon. It's Matt here again with Semper Fly. Went down to the airport this morning, went flying for a few minutes. Nice day, a little blustery. But um, I was looking around, there were about three or four other cubs there this morning practicing flying around. Some of them were a little nicer than mine, and some of them weren't as nice as mine. So I thought I'd do a video on if you're down at your field and you see a Piper Cub that's sitting there and it's looking old and tired like it hasn't flown in a while, you're thinking, I ought to buy that and start flying in one of those. Well, I thought I'd do a video about the five basic things that you ought to be thinking of or be aware of if you're going Piper Cub shopping. First thing I'm going to get into is your basic Piper Cub facts, built from 1939 to 1947. They built about 20,000 of them. There are somewhere around 4,000 of them still on the FAA registry is probably flying. Now some of those are going to be in a barn and not flying, but probably around 4,000. That was a little lower number than I thought. I've read somewhere that there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 of them flying. You're going to break down into two broad classifications, pre-war and post-war. Post-war generally is going to be your 46s and 47s. Those are going to be metal spars. You're also going to find a lot more of those because Piper built almost 7,000 Cubs just in the year 1946. Pre-war is going to be from 38, 39 or so up to about 45. Some of those are going to be metal spars. A lot of those are going to be wood spars. It's not a problem, nothing wrong with a wood spar airplane, but it is something you need to be aware of, the particularities of taking care of that airplane. And also, if you're going to restore it, do you want to put metal spars in and move forward? A few other basic facts about your Cubs is your gross weight you're going to want to be aware of. You're going to want to look at the gross weight of your airplane. Some of them, like the Lycoming powered Cubs, were only 1,170 pounds. Some of them are going to be up to 1,220 pounds, which is what mine is. If you find a Piper Cub that the person says the gross weight's been changed to 1,300 pounds, walk away from it because I've never seen that done legally. There are some modifications that have to be done to increase the gross weight, different struts and things. It's not major, but there are some different things. So you want to know what gross weight you're looking for and what empty weight you're looking for. My Cub's pretty light at about 683 pounds. I've seen ones that sit there on the ground at 850 pounds. Well, if you have an 1170 pound gross weight cub and sitting on the ground it's 800 pounds, you put gas in it and you basically have a single seat airplane. So know your basic years of what you're looking for, know how much of a gross weight you want, and be a little bit mindful of how much, um, how much the useful load is going to be, how much the gross weight is, because, you know, Piper Cubs, it's fun to fly by yourself, but it's also fun to take somebody else flying. You want to make sure that you can legally do that. The second thing I'm going to talk about that's probably going to be one of your first questions is what engine is in my Cub? Piper built the Cub under three what's called type certificates, which is an approval from the FAA to build an airplane. Those are 691, 692, and 698 for your Continental, Franklin, and Lycoming powered Cubs. There are a fair amount of Franklin ones flying around. Uh, they're very nice engines. I wouldn't buy one. Uh, they're a pain to find parts for. If you want to dive into the mechanical joy of owning a Franklin powered Cub, have at it. You'll see a fair amount of Lycoming powered Cubs, but most of the Cubs you're going to find are Continental Cubs. Piper has, within their type certificate, an approved set of Continental engines. It's a bunch of part numbers that range from 40 horsepower up to about 65 horsepower. But Matt, I saw a Cub on my field and he's got an 85 horsepower Continental in it. Yes, he does. It is quite common to put 75, 85, 90 horsepower Continentals in Piper Cubs. That's legal as long as you do it correctly and I'll talk about that a little more in the paperwork section I'll get to in a second. You also can have what was originally a Lycoming Cub that now has a Continental on it. Again, that can be done legally. However, there are some extra things such as a 337, which is an FAA form, and some things that you need to be aware of that are properly in that. But I'm going to save that for the paperwork section in a minute. If you're looking at your 85 horsepower powered Piper Cub, first thing I would look at is see if it has a wing tank, because that's required. If it's got an 85 horsepower engine on it and it doesn't have a wing tank, then that's something wrong with the, the type certificate. The person that put that airplane together either didn't know what they were doing or ignored the paperwork. So, 85 horsepower Cubs are great to fly. I've flown one. 
I don't think the difference in performance is significant enough for my 65 horsepower one that I would spend a lot of extra money to do that. It does climb a little better. It's not really any faster, but that's up to you. If you're looking at the engine, you're going to look at a couple different things. First of all, the prop. Does it have a wood prop or a metal prop? I think these airplanes look fantastic with a wood prop. Wood prop adds a certain classical aviation look to it that I think is really cool. The wood prop is a little quieter. It's a lot smoother than a metal prop. They can get wet. They can get cracks. You might have to send it off to get overhauled a little more often than a metal propeller. You'll lose a little bit in climb performance with a wood prop over a metal prop. I do think they look really cool though. But you will see cops, especially the higher horsepower, 85, 90 horsepower, with metal props. I just don't think it looks right, but that's just a personal preference. You're going to want to look at the magnetos. These Continentals were built with the original Eisenman magnetos. It's kind of the same magneto you see on a John Deere tractor, and I've heard that some of the parts are actually interchangeable. I'm not telling you to do that. I originally had Eisenman mags on my Cub, and they died, which after 74 years, I guess I can't really complain. And I went with regular, slick, upgraded, modern mags, and it's a completely different airplane. It starts better, runs smoother, it is all around an improvement. It's about a $5,000 improvement, but it is an improvement. So if you look in your Cub engine and it's got modern mags on it, fine, that's already been done. If it's got Eisenman mags on it, I would think that a slick upgrade is in your future at some point. Another thing you're going to notice is the eyebrows. That's these metal shrouds that cover the cylinders. These help push airflow over the cylinders in a certain way to keep the engine cool. You'll notice that many of them are cracked. Now you can, there's a bunch of guys on various Piper Forum pages that build new eyebrows and you can get them for around $600 and paint them black and stick them on your cup. I have heard people say that a Piper Cub without cracked eyebrows is probably not airworthy. There's a couple of cracks in mine. Most Cubs that you look close at, you'll probably see cracks in your eyebrows. If you've got real bad cracks in the eyebrows, you can replace your eyebrows, fly your airplane for a while, and then one day pretty soon you're probably going to notice a new crack. So if you see a crack in the eyebrow, it's not a game changer. It's common in these airplanes. You don't want them to be too bad. You're not going to win Grand National at Oshkosh with a lot of cracks in your eyebrows, but you do want to be aware of that. The next area I'm going to talk about is fabric. You know, these airplanes, there's a metal fuselage covered in fabric. They were originally covered in cotton. You treated it with various chemicals. It got tight. You painted it, and that's what you flew around it. Cotton had a certain finite lifespan before it went bad. Actually, all the fabric can go bad. There are three common fabric coverings that you're going to see on a Cub today. Superflight, Seconite, and Polyfiber. My airplane's covered in Seconite. Now, my airplane was covered back in the late 60s, so the fabric is pretty old. It still punches fine. Now, what I mean by that is the fabric has a certain tension it has to hold to be airworthy. And there are various testing mechanisms that you use. One of them is called the Mall Tester after Mall Aircraft. It basically looks like a big thermometer with a spring inside of it and a little thumbnail on the end of it. You push the end of it up against the fabric, you push the spring, and it reads how many pounds of pressure the fabric is holding before you punch a hole into it. The fabric, when it's new, is upwards of 80, 90 pounds, and it has to be down somewhere 20, 30 pounds to be airworthy depending upon what type it is. As long as you keep the fabric dry, out of UV, away from the sunlight, and take care of it, then it's supposed to be lifetime. I've gone to Sun and Fun a couple times the last couple years, and I walk up to the various fabric vendors they have there, and I ask them, it says, hey, you guys say that Seconite is lifetime fabric. Is that true? And they've all told me, yes, absolutely. If you take care of Seconite, it should last longer than you will. Well, I'm kind of testing that theory. My, my Seconite is getting very old. My paint's starting to chip, but it still punches perfectly legal. It doesn't look great, but it's still perfectly legal. But if you get a cub and you're looking at needing fabric or wanting to redo the fabric, you will hear all kinds of horror stories about what it costs. I've kind of been in the midst of looking at recovering part or all of my airplane for about the last 18 months, and I've talked to a lot of people about what's involved in recovering my cub. I've been quoted somewhere around four to $5,000 per wing. 
and somewhere around twelve to fifteen thousand dollars for the fuselage and the tail. So put those two numbers together and you've probably got twenty five or thirty thousand dollars. One of the things you do need to be aware of is when you rip the fabric off of your airplane you might find something else that needs to be fixed. You might find corrosion on the metal structure or something else that has to be addressed. So if you buy a cub and you strip all the fabric off in addition to the cost of the fabric you are probably going to have to address some other issues in the airplane before you recover it. I've been told by a couple different people who've looked at my airplane that my Seconite fabric fuselage is in good enough shape that it can be repainted. There is a chemical process that you put on the fabric to help get some of the old paint off, softens the fabric up, you then retreat it with some chemicals and repaint it. I don't know if I'm going to go down that path, I'm still a little ways away from there, but it is possible to repaint fabric. You will have some fabric guys tell you though that they'll never re repaint fabric. If the fabric looks bad, they'll want to rip it off. And that's one other thing I want to mention about fabric. And it's like this with a lot of things in the aviation industry. I've called a couple shops, the ones that would call me back. I talked to one in particular, very experienced guy. I think he knows everything in the world about, about fabric and probably does a fantastic job. But his only interest in recovering an airplane is basically a full restoration, which means he's going to take the entire airplane apart down to every nut and bolt, put it back together. You certainly can do that. He said he's had that done to some airplanes and he handed him a $75,000 bill for it when it was done. I'm sure it was a gorgeous airplane. Fly off to Oshkosh, enter it, you might win Grand National and a little trophy. But that's one option. You also can recover the, the airplane piecemeal your shades of cub yellow might not all be exactly the same, but that's part of the joy of owning a classic aircraft. One other thing you're going to look at your airplane is you're going to look at the brakes it has. It's either going to have original expander brakes like mine does and what you see here. You press on the brake pedal and a small balloon inside of a cylinder expands and rubs up against the inside of the wheel. And rather than stopping you, it enters a suggestion to the airplane that it ought to go slower and perhaps eventually stop. You will also see cubs with a more modern Cleveland or Grove type caliper brakes like you see here. These are pretty common. It's probably $1,500 to $2,000 to have the conversion. Nothing wrong with those. I kind of like my expander brakes. I fly mostly off a grass field. They've always been enough for me. Expander brakes are getting difficult to find parts for, so if my expander brakes are ever really shot and beyond repair, it's a good chance I'll upgrade to uh, Grover Cleveland's at an annual just because that's easier than chasing down a bunch of very old beat up expander brake parts to keep my expander brakes going. So most Cubs that I come across when I'm at airfields walking around, I see a Cub, probably 90% of them have the caliper upgraded brakes. So the having expanded brakes is not a deal breaker, nothing wrong with that. If you fly on pavement, it takes a little more effort to use the brakes properly, get used to them. But if you find the airplane you like and it's got expander brakes, that wouldn't bother me because mine has that and it's been just fine. The last thing I'm going to mention about these pointers for looking at your first cub is the paperwork. I have heard an urban legend that are, there actually exists a Piper Cub with 100% correct paperwork. I don't know that I believe that. My cub, built in 1946, only has logs from 1953. You will see cubs that it'll say complete logs and you have the logs from day one. You will find a lot of cubs that do not have complete logs back 75 or 80 years. That's not a deal breaker. You want them back fairly long and if you had really short term logs, say five or eight years, you would really want a cub expert to go through that airplane to make sure that there's no hidden surprises in there. But if it's been receiving regular annuals, for 40 or 50 years, you still want to get it inspected and have a cub person look at it. But the paperwork issue, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, regarding the engines. Say you see a Piper Cub and you look in the logs and its type certificate is the Lycoming type certificate and it's got a Continental 65 on it. That's fine, but there are several different types of paperwork that have to be in that airplane for it to be legal. You can go to the FAA's website, punch in your serial number, and get every FAA-issued paperwork they've ever issued about that airplane, including 337s. 
337 is a form that's done whenever there's major repair, which an engine swap would be. So you're going to want to get your FAA document trail and you're going to want to compare that to the logs. And I understood the basics of this, but I had a mechanic who knew it a lot better than I did go through it. There are several ADs, airworthiness directives about cubs. You want to make sure that they've been addressed in the logs. You want to make sure that it's got the engine it says on it. You want to make sure it's been weighed properly. You want to make sure it's legal. None of those things are insurmountable to fix, but a lot of mechanics nowadays don't work on cubs. And if you pull your cub up to your average Cessna mechanic, and he, he looks at the logs and he says, well, this cub used to have a Franklin on it. And now it's got a Continental 90 horse on it. And you say, go through it annual. He might hand the logs back to you and say, I'm not interested in going through there because he's going to have to educate himself because he just doesn't deal with it a lot. There are a lot of cub people out there. There are a lot of assets you can use in the cub world. There's a pretty active cub forum on the Internet, which has a lot of people that know a lot more about cubs than I do. There's the Cub Club based out of Pennsylvania and Lock Haven where he has all the type certificates and can help you trace down the paperwork on your cub and tell you its history. So if you really want a cub and you find the one that you're in love with, there's no problem in there that can't be fixed. But you do want to know what problems you're faced with when you're going into it. Quick review, there's about 5,000 of these airplanes left. You want to look at your paperwork and see what engine's supposed to be in it, what your gross weight is. You want to look at your engine and look at the mags, the prop, the brakes. Find out the condition of the fabric. Get somebody knowledgeable to go through the paperwork. Get an idea of what's going on with your fabric and if you're looking at a fabric restoration or not. Once you go through those steps and have a knowledgeable cub person look at your airplane, then you can be fairly safe that you're still going to have some surprises, but the surprises are not probably insurmountable. One of the things I found out in my paperwork is at some point about 30 years ago, the person bought an STC to put, put a tailwheel hook on the back of my airplane, as if somebody with a 65 horsepower Cub wanted to tow banners or tow gliders. I had no idea why they did that. It's in the log books. It's there. It's not a problem, but that was a surprise I got. I did have one person who was looking at my airplane. He really wanted to buy one, and he was sniffing around my airplane. And he came back and he said, well, I'd never buy this airplane because they had an STC for a tail hook in it. Okay, whatever. You can fix most of these problems, but you need to know what the problems are going in. I looked at a recent Barnstormers and I see cubs in there starting at around 30 to 33,000 on up to fully restored ones that are astronomical. There was a cub on my airfield that sold for $27,000 a few months ago that was mid-time engine, older fabric, three different shades of cub yellow, but it was perfectly legal and safe to hop in and fly around on sunny Sunday afternoons, which is kind of what cubs are made for. I hope if you're interested in looking at a Piper Cub that just these four or five pointers will, will help you understand a little bit of what you're looking at when you're reading a Barnstormers ad or looking at an airplane. You'll still want to have an expert look at the airplane and the logs, but hopefully this will answer a few of your questions because believe me, they're a blast to fly. In the meantime, if you've got a cub or you're shopping, let me know your questions. If you like the video, hit subscribe. Keep flying. Thanks.